to everyone. A very warm welcome on a somewhat blustery evening in most of Scotland. Uh, I'm your host, John Drummond, for the next 60 minutes. And these will be 60 exciting minutes, I can guarantee you. Now, I know what you're thinking. Well, he says that every week. But actually, in every week, it's pretty much the case. And this is no exception. But you know, before we get into the, the, the meat of, the, of, of tonight's show, let me remind you, it's been another great day for democracy. Uh, Kevin, could you put your uh, mute on, please? Thank you. Uh, so it's been a great day for democracy. Uh, the, the, as the Tories continue to deny a referendum for Scotland, we hear today that it's had a huge impact. The SNP vote has shot up, uh, as, as has the Green vote too. And the uh, projections are that the SNP would end up with 73 seats or so in the Scottish Parliament if there was an election held right now, uh, with the Tories on 27, Labour on 19, uh, the Greens on five, and the Liberal Democrats also on, on, the, on the same number. Uh, so you can see that uh, all of the uh, government propaganda that's taken place over the last uh, uh, few uh, weeks or so has been hugely impactive. Thanks for joining us this evening. Uh, as I say, we have uh, yet another great guest, uh, and I'm really excited that he's able to join us. Uh, tonight, the nation talks to Jerry Hassan. Now, Jerry is not only an accomplished author and commentator on all things Scottish and so much more besides, uh, he's also one of the country's leading thinkers and strategists. Uh, and if ever the country needed thinkers and strategists, it's now <laughs> with the SNP <laughs> at each other's throats continually and continuously and uh, the opposition, frankly, nowhere. That's not good, frankly, for anyone. So we need the country's thinkers and strategists. That's why we're so pleased that Jerry is able to find time to join us this evening. So remember, TNT stands for The Nation Talks. So this is your opportunity. If you have a question or a query for Jerry, now's the time to ask us. You know, we'll try and answer as many as, you ca as we can in the forthcoming 60 minutes. So feel free. The Nation Talks, The Nation Talks, largely with your voice. So it's important we hear from you. Please let us know what you want to do. I've got my iPhone handy. Uh, you can also contact Indie Live. You can write to me at my email address, john at cliche.com. There's a bunch of ways to get in touch. Make use of them, please. So now to our guest. Uh, talk to the nation, the nation talks uh, to Jerry Hassan. How are you, Jerry? How are you coping with the pandemic? Um, well, you know, um, okay to good, uh, really. And uh, I think like anyone who's been healthy um, throughout this um, pandemic and uh, this emergency, uh, counting counting your laurels and counting your, your, your blessings, um, you know, I, I, I haven't fallen uh, ill. Um, none of my uh, immediate friends and family have fought, fallen ill. So I'm just very, very um, uh, feel blessed by that and feel very, very, um, you know, Concerned and, and worried about my, my fellow my fellow human beings, uh, yeah. the, the state of the country, um, the the you know the, without completely getting straight into politics, the shambles, the disgrace that is is the, is the British government on a human level, on a human level. Because I mean, what I, I have felt and experienced is that uh, I've uh, I was already doing quite a lot of local things um, yeah. or quite a few local things. Uh, I've, I've accentuated those. Um, did the, just lots of small scale things, getting involved in things. And I was planning to do this before. I used to play golf when I was a teenager. Um, so I've taken up playing golf, um, which lots of people say, oh, you don't let a golf on time. Lots of working class people used to play <laughs> golf in Scotland. It's not, it's not all posh people. Um, uh, I started playing chess again because I played chess when I was a kid. Um, I'm in the first fruits of doing home baking. Um, did a oh. bean set of scones yesterday. Um, and but my last thing is, for, for years, right, I've been trying to get an original map of the British Empire, which is the ones that used to hang in schools when some of us were kids. Oh, yeah. And they were there till about the late 70s, long after the yeah. British Empire. And yeah. people said to me in map oh, you can't get them because they break. They used to break. They wouldn't at the top and wouldn't at the bottom. Anyway, a brilliant Paisley architectural reclamation yard found me a 1958 map of the British Empire and the other empires just as they're beginning to decolonize. So that was, that was an amazing find. Oh, That's a bit, of my, a bit of my time, you know. <laughs> That reminds me of the old joke about the kids in the class and the teacher is standing there looking at exactly at one of those maps. Red, the whole world is covered in red. 
And she said to the kids, and furthermore, yeah. the sun never sets on the British Empire. Why is that? The little Irish kid at the back of the class said, it's because God doesn't touch the Brits in the dark. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so there we are. So tell us a bit about yourself, Jerry. I mean, where were you born? Where were you brought up? Uh, tell us about your family. Of course. Well, I'll just tell you quick the other adjunct to that, and I'll get straight to that. Is when I, I wrote a piece about finding this map, and this is the wonder of things on Facebook that I did check is the British Empire legally ended on it, wait for it, the 1st of January 1983, because that's when the Thatcher government's Nationality Act of 1981 came into force. And all these places, like the Falkland Islands, that had been legally known as colonies, stopped being colonies and became overseas dependencies. So to think, yeah. you know, that's in our living memory. The thing ended. And someone told me that through Facebook, which I was just thought was a great, great find to get. And, and it's completely right. So anyway, to your question, um, I was born born in Dundee um, and grew up in an area, in a, in a council estate in the northwest of the city called Ardor where um, I spent all, all the 1970s um, and early 1980s. Grew up in a mm-hmm. tower block. Um, it was a, it was a six tower blocks built on a former golf course, so piles and piles of green space, safe play areas. And um, I had a you know, pretty, pretty idyllic childhood, really. No, my parents worked. Um, I was the only child. I'm an only child, uh, which meant there was no financial worries for my parents. Um, I never heard my parents argue about money, um, et cetera. And so all that's loads and loads of positives. And in that, um, I mean, there's never any chance of me not being political in a sense. <laughs> it's, it's a very, very political household in that my dad was a member of the Communist Party. He wasn't very active in the Communist Party. He was a bit of an armchair activist. You know, somebody yeah. talked about the revolution. And, but he was an NCR, um, worked for National Cash Register, who were big with, along with Time oh, yeah. Yeah. in Dundee. And so he was, a, he was a shop steward for part of that period. And, 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 and politically, even though he was less active than my mum, he was politically illiterate and had read Capital Three volumes when he was a, when he was a teenager. Mm-hmm. Um, when I started reading Tony Benn when I'm still at school, he would, he would say to me, ah, he's got good intent, but they're a bit thin, <laughs> theoretically. <laughs> <laughs> and my mum was um, ran the local pharmacy Oh yeah, um, and uh, in that saved many people from death from doctors' prescriptions, um, and she also was involved in the community centre, ran the community newsletter where I did my first real you know writing because I did yeah. um, a pop column there. It was uh, published, uh, it was published uh, six times a year, uh, bi monthly, and so for a couple of years I did a pop column. And uh, my mum, to get to the point here, my mum was an organizer. She organised rent stripes with my 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 anti against Ted Heath and so on, to yep. organize other things, women's groups. And um, so she she lived politics and my dad kind of talked it. And and it wasn't really until I'm in my mid-20s that I thought, wait a minute, my mum was the real political one. <laughs> and 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 I think, you know, I've got lots of failings in my politics and life, but I've kind of always tried to understand that tension between doing and 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 talking about. Yeah, yeah. It's pretty easy to talk about it, isn't it? Yeah. I, I, I always feel for politicians. I mean, I, I couldn't be a politician, frankly, uh, because, well, you know, it's, 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 it's a speciality all of its own. I'm not sure people outside politics fully yeah. uh, appreciate that and understand it sometimes. Because um, not everyone's cut out for that sort of job. Uh, I, I just find it interesting. So you're born in Dundee. You, you grew up in this uh, activist household. Yeah. Uh, you went to school there, I assume. Yeah, I went to school. I went to <laughs> I went to a primary school. It was literally one minute from my house, and uh, I've never been a natural morning person, right? <laughs> and um, and um, but that's still that's still the case. And I've become more and more like I'm, I'm I'm a late you know evening person. I like the quiet of the night. But um, I, I'm sure it got into going to primary school. I could literally get up at eight forty five in the morning, have breakfast, whatever it was. And yeah. get down to the school by nine o'clock because one minute down the road, down a slope as well, down, down a <laughs> gradient, and and hence I think that's just, just that was that was my part. And then I went to a secondary school called Rockwell High School that had a great period because they were going to build an outdoor high, which is the state I was living in in the seventies. Yeah. And my mum kept saying, "We've got to keep the council to building this." And people go, "No, no, it's going to happen." But what yeah. happened is when the seventies cuts of the Labour government really kicked in, they cancelled the school, but 
what had happened was the school I went to, which is about a mile or two away, they had yeah. got all these great teachers from including the local private school on the yeah. promise of building this new high school. So we had a, a kind of really lucky cohort. It was also a period where even though it began to end, all our parents had still experienced work and secure um, salaries yeah. and so on. So I had all that. And this, this school was, you know, lots of us went on to do, you know, university, further further stuff after that. And after I left, as Dundee hit lots of issues and Ardor did, um, I remember one year, about 85 or 86, it was in the bottom five schools in all Scotland, you know. So it's interesting when you reflect on that, your own experience as a working class kid and what happened in those states, and those states in terms of like the opportunity and then what yeah. happened through a whole host of things, Thatcher, unemployment, drugs, yeah. um, cuts, and you just, you know, you, you feel you feel responsibility there as well about, about what's happened. Yeah. Do you still regard yourself as working class? It's a good question. Um, not really in the sense that, not because when when I moved to Glasgow in 1992, uh, then, uh, and I moved to Pollock Shields, um, I had this view, um, I probably really in many ways still was working class then, but I had this view, uh, one thing that really irritated me was middle class people pretending to be working class. And and when I lived in Pollock Shields in a tenement, this is by one of the poshest bits of Glasgow, Pollock Shields West, commonly called Maxwell Park, and people don't want to use uh, the term Pollock Shields. And you'd have lots of people living in those fancy houses there going, oh, working class is marvellous. I love being working class, you know. And that, I found that always personally offensive. Um, so I definitely was still working class there in lots of ways, but I always thought of myself as, yeah, be, being middle class, but coming from a working class background, it's a big part of my identity and, and, my, and my background and yeah. classes. I mean, you know, any, anybody that knows me would say, you know, it's class is something I think runs through absolutely um, everything. And Scotland has got, you know, we've got stuff there that isn't just about um, Westminster in, in, our, um, in, our, in our society. Yeah, yeah. Well, I've interviewed lots of people, people who've been great guests on the show, and they've often talked about that sort of upbringing um, mm. you know that that sort of interesting lad of perts uh, uh, they frequently uh, give plaudits for Scottish education, even though it gets a lot of stick yeah. in other places. It, for them personally, it was a huge, yeah. big thing in their lives. It made a big uh, impact on them, uh, and they're very grateful for it. Frankly, so you moved on. I take it to university at some stage. Yes, well, I, I didn't have. This has actually turned to be a positive for me um, because I wasn't sure about this in my 20s. I had a kind of unconventional, it wasn't a completely straightforward and, or smooth ride. There was a couple of bumps in a way. But what happened uh, is, to give you it very, very succinctly, um, when I'm growing up and had a you know, really great childhood, uh, my parents um, had a kind of like a couple of like hits in a sense um, where they eventually, for a variety of reasons, split up. Now, that happens. But what happened in that was my mother left my father and my dad, Eddie, Edwin, didn't, didn't react to it very well. I mean, fundamentally, he, he, he had a broken heart. And uh, so for a couple of years um, after school and college, I basically, as well as working in a variety of kind of community projects, I um, kind of helped him put his life back together. Um, yeah. uh, you know, he'd, he'd put up debts, et cetera. You know, I won't go into this too much. But put up debts. And so I, I, I helped him kind of like pay all these things off and uh, supported him um, with yeah. his you know, with his support in a sense, yeah. and and so what that meant was um, the, I wasn't sure of this at the time, but it all turned out quite positive. And I went to university um, a couple of years later in the, in the, in the sort of late eighties. Went to Glasgow, um, and um, and by this point, I've been obviously involved in politics quite a bit because I joined the Labour Party in eighty two, eighty three in Dundee. Uh, and uh, this is the period of George Galloway, so that was quite an experience. Uh, the first conversation I ever had with him, he told me off about something. <laughs> he said, mind your own business, young lad, he said to me about something, and uh, I thought, right, okay, uh, I, won't, I won't listen to that, but I just note it, you know? And so I went to university late, and by that point, it meant I was um, more able, even more than the education it had given me, to... to Take part in like arguing in tutorials yeah. and and being present and you know uh, yeah not being a wallflower etc yeah. and so that was that was a really good experience I did sociology and politics at Glasgow um, and um, could have could have gone on to do a PhD practically immediately but wanted to then go into work so I worked in a variety of, of voluntary sector organisations uh, then ran a Scottish think tank um, as the Parliament comes about and then 
from about 20 years ago of work um, freelance. I did, did do my PhD at the University of West of Scotland, got a job there, uh, which was a kind of one of these time-limited things of modern academia, which is fine uh, on some levels. And then after that, uh, Dundee, I went to Dundee and I've been at Dundee for uh, three years, uh, uh, which is my hometown. <laughs> uh, but uh, most of the work, given you know COVID and et cetera, is uh, done from where I live, Glasgow. Right. And when you say you went to Dundee, you're teaching at Dundee, is that, is that okay? Uh, researching. So Research. researching. They, they actually said to me, it was quite interesting in this conversation, how people define you, you know. Uh, they said to me, <laughs> you're a contemporary Scottish historian, Jerry. That's what you've been doing the last 20 odd years. And I said, really? Contemporary Scottish history? I just thought I was doing politics, you know. And uh, they said, well, yeah, you're doing politics, but what you've been doing is we need to understand contemporary Scottish history. And that's what you've been doing. The biggest debate in contemporary history is actually what is contemporary history? Yeah. <laughs> and it's an argument about whether it starts in Britain anyway, and Scotland yeah. would be the same on this, in 1945 or 1979. The argument doesn't really yeah. take it very far. It's just basically events up until quite recently. So the independence referendum, for example, would be part of our contemporary history, or it's of becoming course. part of our contemporary of history. Of course. So well, that, we've, that, got, that, we've got some questions coming in, so let's take some of those and we'll come back uh, to talk about uh, Jerry in a second, if we may. James Reith is saying, uh, with the way that Boris is changing the laws, how likely do you think that he will shut down the Scottish project next year? Shut down the Scottish project? Mm. Yeah. Um, close to, nothing's ever zero in this, right? Close, close to zero. I mean, I, I, I've long thought that if you make um, democracy and independence nearly completely synonymous. It's 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 goodbye. You know, it's it's, it's that's arrivederci to the union. The union is whatever people think about it. The union is based on consent. This is this is an organic union which has had advantages and disadvantages because we ended up with a parliament when we wanted one. We ended up with an independence referendum when we wanted one. There's lots lots of failings that are fairly obvious to people, but this is not. Catalonia. This is not the, the Spanish yeah. kind of the Spanish kind of strange constitution that we try to understand came about because of a Franco and the experience of the Spanish Civil War mm. and yeah. the Spanish Civil War. Where Franco, not to get into this too much, but Franco reacted against a whole host of things: the left wing government and the rise of the kind of uh, places like Catalonia. So it's yeah. a rigid constitution. Britain isn't that, and and Toryism. And unionism used to really understand this. It's it's and it began to decay probably before Thatcher because the decay is a long, long, long term one. Partly about empire and religion and so on. But I think, I mean, Boris Johnson clearly doesn't have a Scottish feel or a Scottish agenda, and they're and they're really like they're playing for time to try and hope either something comes up, you know, the SNP blow themselves up, um, or or they come up with some wheeze that yet to be identified. You know, like some huge pro union project like building bridges everywhere and roads everywhere. But yeah. no. There's issues around powers and there's issues around um, the responsibilities between the, the, the parliaments and yeah. there's issues about the union and international law and all sorts of things, but no, uh, abolishing the parliament, uh, close to zero, not quite zero. Can you achieve the same effect, though, simply by removing its financial uh, base and diverting the funds through the Scottish office? And uh, and simply running the place uh, directly from Westminster, direct rule and everything but name. It's a good question. I mean, I'm I'm not sure that works in in in, in the long uh, run. To try what that would involve, you try to think about it for a second. What that involves trying to build a parallel state, um, a kind of bridgehead into Scotland, a pro-union bridgehead that becomes a parallel. Um, state. Um, I don't think that's that's possible. I think, put it this way, I've always thought, I've always thought this, that despite the fact that Labour legislated for Parliament, um, the legislative for an assembly it didn't happen in the Parliament, it's it's the Tories that have the more flexible version of the union because part of Labour is is centralist in the sense it regards the British state as a thing you redistribute through. So they need yeah. a strong state as well as the fact they did uh, devolution. I've always thought that, the, I mean, this is declining by the day, that the in, Scott, in British Toryism and Unionism, there's a kernel of a, still a small understanding of what the United Kingdom is and that how to try and get back to an adaptive version of it that, that isn't the past one, but yeah. that, that recognises, you know, it now. now. Now, they could have, look at Brexit, 
there was it was possible to do Brexit that recognised the four nations reality to use the, the, the language of, of COVID at the moment. They, they couldn't do it because because of that decline. But there's still bits of Toryism. People like Rory Stewart, who I, I spoke to uh, during the independence referendum and had a couple of debates with, he intrinsically understood this. So if you were to get that. But then you have to make the jump that people like even Gordon Brown don't make, which is you have to remake the political centre. This isn't just about like, you know, more powers to Scotland or what you're doing well. It's about the, the atrophied, decaying political centre remaking its yeah. understanding. Of it. And that's where, you know, for all sorts of reasons that you know people know they're fighting against a set of a set of forces in there, you know, the corporate state, um, the fact that it's, it's 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 obsessed with winners and so on, and a, and, a, and a grotesque version of Britain. But there still is a small element of intelligence at work there that might might just kick in if they realise the stakes are high enough. I'm just posing that. I'm not saying they're going to yeah. happen. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was, it was a good it was a good pose. Uh, the the thing, I mean, what some guests have put to me is the fact that who are not inside the constitutional silo, but represent uh, a, a different point of view. And they've said that the, the unionist uh, impetus is almost entirely emotional uh, right now. Okay. It wasn't always that way, uh, and it could be changed, but right now it's uh, producing such enormously poor results, like the ones I mentioned at the front of the yeah. show, because it's driven by emotion and not by strategy or logic or deep thought. Is that yeah. your sense of it as well? well? Well, yes, yes, to an extent. And the, the query, query is an emotional argument that they're putting forward. Um, and you saw that in, you know, the, the Neil Oliver piece that that's gathered much, much comment <laughs> um, over the weekend on um, on the these islands and uh, and the Daily Mail. There is there is the, there is the, the argument put forward by people about the currency. There's currency as kind of the last last shibboleth as well. And I do think you know. We, we do have to recognise independence has thinking and, and serious work to do um, in coming up with an offer that is different from 2014. Mm -hmm. And there is the what I would call the transactional argument, which is it basically tries to argue that because they identify this the, the amount of money that is a fiscal transfer between uh, UK and Scotland, that somehow that's, that's it. That Scotland couldn't be independent, uh, misses the fact of you know, how you disaggregate public spending, all sorts of things, as, as, as people um, know. I think, I think the biggest thing, right, here, here's what I think has been the biggest advantage for independence over the last like 20 years. It's an argument put forward by, I mean, I completely agree with it, but it was put forward very, very well by the academic Ben Jackson this year in his book, The Case for Scottish Independence, which doesn't argue that. It's a book about the argument for independence uh, over the last 20 odd, 30 years. Very, very well argued. And he says that. Uh, and it's something I've experienced as well, that the pro-union argument basically has never understood the independence argument. It's never tried to understand the independence argument possible in any real sense. It's, it's stereotypes about flags, um, emotions, you know, battles, you know, Bruce, Wallace, et cetera, et cetera. And it's never understood that, well, because that was, that was an argument decades ago, clearly. Sure. It's about mostly democratic legitimacy, um, about... The, the, the mandate and purpose and drive of government here and of, of, of our choices democratically. And he yeah. said, they just don't get it. And my experience, I was a member of the Labour Party for, for years, for 20 odd years. Um, and for a large part of that, I was, I was quietly pro-indie um, in, the, in, in the home rule groups, is, is that they've never understood that. The, the, those people who have been prominent, like the Gordon Browns, like the Douglas Alexanders, they've never actually thought seriously about the argument for independence because they've dismissed it. And that is an advantage to independence and it's terrible politics from their point of view. To not understand your opponent's yeah. legitimate arguments, just terrible uh, politics. Yeah, I think that's the point that's been put to me by people who represent a non-independence perspective. They are deeply saddened, it seems to me, by some of the approaches that the unionist parties are taking because they see them as being, frankly, uh, you, not terribly helpful. And certainly the opinion polls would back that up. But don't you think there's a certain irony here? Mm. Because at one time, the independence movement was all about flags mm. and mm. emotion and history. Yeah. Now, increasingly, it's about the mechanics. Uh, yeah. I mean, should there be a Scottish pound? Uh, what, what, how to handle deficits or the fact that there may not, in fact, be a deficit, indeed. Mm -hmm. uh, all, all of those sort of discussions, uh, relationships uh, internationally, 
a whole bunch of discussions about the, the sort of nitty gritty. Uh, and yet the unionist side has gone exactly the opposite way. They've abandoned the nitty gritty, the, the issues that you just yes, described but, and but reached totally for been a crossover. There's totally been a crossover between, I mean, what one thing that not all pro-union, I mean, I, I sometimes try and be careful not using the term unionist, uh, but because mm. clearly uh, not all people that voted yes are nationalists, are Scottish now, and clearly not all people that vote no are unionists. And indeed, one of my, my, my political friends, uh, the blogger Southside Girl, she said last year, just spontaneously in discussion, she said, there's no such thing as no voters, there's only people who voted no. And uh, we said to her, did you just come up with that? Or did you? She said, no, I just came up with that. And we said, well, we then fine-tuned it and ruined it by saying, well, obviously there are people who vote no like that, and there are people who vote yes, but actually it's a kernel of idea. How do you, it's just totally brilliant, you know? Yeah. Um, so I do think that about the yes and no, um, because there's a tendency also on yes to think of some parts of yes, think all our side, all our side, is like completely all agreed and, you know, um, signed off and that's 45% and we can only go um, upwards. But no, your point's absolutely right. It's when I was um, reading the, uh, sorry to mention this again, the Neil Oliver piece, and I, I was scanning it, for obviously. And apart from the historical inaccuracies, which were just like, you know, Britain as an island, hello, you know, um, well, or United Kingdom as an island, yeah. to be accurate, given all the islands of Scotland and, and half of another one, um, is it, it reminded me of the sort of thing I read in my childhood about Scotland. It was, which is exactly the point you make. It was like reading a Clifford Hanley essay. It used to go on about our beautiful glens and hills. And, and, and I used to read it as a child thinking, this is all fine and dandy, but, you know, stop deal, dealing with Scotland I live in, which is like working class Dundee, um, or, or those issues, which, you know, were, um, you know, just in front of us. And so there's definitely been a crossover, um, which is, 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 is telling because I think, let me just put it this way. From 2014, it doesn't mean to say it's always going to remain the same, but the emotional argument for the union in, in the post-election, post-referendum survey evidence we have was quite weak in its resonance with people because it hadn't been made in a generation. And if unionism is going to now try and remake that, like in that piece I'm talking about, I think, I think it would have to be part of a grand design project about the United Kingdom that, that, that we made yet to have any traction at all. And um, I don't think it's inevitable, you know, what happens is that Scotland convincingly votes for independence. I think that is still has to be won and remade and uh, restated all the time. But the union argument is in serious crisis on this, to put it mildly, you know? Yeah. Well, it, it, any, any movement that's going to be in crisis if it, if it abandons logic and reaches for emotion. Yeah. Uh, uh, it, it's fine. That, I agree with you. It's fine if you can come up with a blend of emotion and logic and strategy, that's usually pretty effective. But something to have one club in your golf bag, if you don't mind me talking about golf for a second. <laughs> <laughs> well, by the way, we have a, had a comment here. Rowan Young says, Jerry, you ought to try Frisbee golf. You try <laughs> Frisbee golf? I've heard about it. I have heard about it, yeah. Well, I anyway, think I'm to normal it, looks like, it looks like William Young is commending it for you, to you. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, so there's, there's a serious point there. Uh, and and uh, also, uh, I noticed that when the results of that latest opinion poll by Ipsos Mori became available, showing that I think 75% uh, of those polls felt that uh, the SNP uh, stands for Scotland. Uh, you know, it, it's, it, it, it was somebody on the non-independent side was saying there must be a whole bunch of hard unionists in that 75%. Uh, which I guess is the point that you're making too, Jerry. In other words, there's a fluidity here. Uh, it's yeah. not cut and dried. Uh, that people do change their minds, but it's a very telling argument when you ask people who stands for you, and they say this group do to the degree of seventy-five percent. That's 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 an enormous amount of traction. Uh, now these are very odd circumstances. We have a pandemic still raging. The vaccine may be around the corner, but nonetheless, it does colour people's views on things. Uh, so that 75% may change. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, even looking at it on its face value, uh, I can understand why it, if I was not in the independence camp, I'd be saying, oh boy, this is things were bad, but this looks much, much worse. Yeah, uh, Because it, it gives the... Scottish government an enormous platform 
yeah. uh, uh, and clearly shows that they, their, their approach resonates with a very large majority, uh, which is, if you look at historically at secessionist movements, uh, their biggest challenge is how to persuade the people in the middle to join the 30% that want constitutional change. That's absolutely right. Yeah. Uh, the, the other 30%, of course, will never change uh, <laughs> uh, very much, uh, yeah. perhaps, uh, despite the fluidity we talked about earlier. Yeah. So if you were to look down the pike, as yeah. they say in the States, uh, and it's, say, two years from now, what would you forecast that Scotland looks like? Well, if you take a long view of this, right, I... I from the moment Labour Party, if, if, if people remember when we ended up with the Parliament because um, Labour won 97 election and there was then a referendum, they, they, they actually took them until 1996 to announce there was going to be a referendum for the Parliament because before they'd been argued, we'd voted before for an assembly, it didn't happen. Anyway. So we voted three to one for a Parliament. I always thought from that point on, because what Labour did was they decoupled voting Labour from bringing about a Parliament. The S- I also thought the SNP would do the same, and they did. I think it was like 2000, the SNP came up with the policy of um, go SNP, get an independence referendum. Really smart politics. And I always thought from that point on that, that Scots being canny, um, which is a cliche, but, but in terms of like embracing radical change, that the Scots would probably take two referendums to vote for independence. Because I've always been influenced by a whole host of people. I mean, Tom Nair has to be cited here in terms of an enormous influence of how I came to independence in, in the 80s as a young uh, political activist, um, along with people like Neil Asherson and a whole host of other people. Um, Bernard Crick would be another one. And um, I always thought that, it, that, that two referendums gave the British state a chance to, like, wake up you know, wake up the fact that the British establishment was under threat, yeah. that it's order, yeah. that it's way of doing things. Well, now, look at look at, look at at politics. If we think about, never mind like day-to-day politics, COVID, et cetera, Boris Johnson, look at politics since 2014. The yeah. British state, despite what actually, when McCluskey, the trade union leader called, a near-death experience, yeah. absolutely right, has done bugger all. I mean, I'm yeah. not talking about whether the vow was implemented or not, because it isn't just about powers coming to Scotland. It's about the, the centre's understanding of, of Britain and its failure to understand, you know, the, the distribution of how it does power, where it distributes resources, who it chooses, the so-called winners, you know, like the COVID contracts and so on, and its grotesque model of corporate cap- capital. So I've always been a bit sanguine in the sense of, like, the people that have wanted a referendum immediately or, you know, as soon as possible after Brexit, I've always thought we have to play. It's not quite a long game, but, but, but a more canny game in the sense that if if there's a pro-independence majority next year, if there's a pro-independence majority in the parliament and in the popular vote, whether that's the SNP or the SNP and Greens, and the, the UK government says no, what I think that does is that that even more, we're not going to be Catalonia that makes democracy and independence absolutely like synonymous. Yeah. And that is a disaster. That is a complete cul-de-sac for, for <clears> the union. <throat> yeah. Whether it's whatever it is after 2021, if there's a pro-independence majority in seats and votes, there will be another independence um uh, referendum. The issue will be the timing and and the kind of like, you know, the nature of how the question is agreed, which doesn't necessarily have to follow the St Andrews agreement, but there will be another independence referendum. And that will then be an issue of like, have have they dug themselves into a cul-de-sac and have we done the serious work that is not, assume, we, we, we should never assume on such a fundamental choice that it's in the bag. Uh, I mean, anybody that thinks that would be like, I think personally, bonkers. Um, and we have also come up with some of the tangible stuff that answers some of the questions. We won't be able yeah. to answer every single thing, but we have to have a better position on the currency. We have to have stuff on the EU and, and we have to have some figures on the alleged, you know, the issues of the transfers because Scotland suffered in other ways financially massively. You know, 10 years of austerity at UK level that we didn't, vote for, yeah. that's had a consequence on public spending and, and public spending per head everywhere in Scotland. And we mm-hmm. have to come have facts on some of these things because we can't rely on just, you know, uh, winning it by default, basically. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. I mean, again, if you look at historically secessionist movements, uh, what tends to be the tipping point is not so much what the secessionists do, i.e. the people who favour independence or constitutional change. It's usually a series of blunders on the uh, on the less progressive side, 
that causes yeah. that causes that it creates the tipping point. I mean, you can look back to the American Revolution. You can look at many others, and it's invariably the uh, controlling group makes mistakes around the secessionists uh, making uh, in, enormous uh, uh, improvements or suggested improvements. They, they, uh, they I mean, they, they, they tend to win simply by uh, not being the other side, as it were, and letting the other side. I mean, it's still cliche about when the other guys. Uh, kicking the ball in his own net, you shouldn't interfere. Uh, yeah. And I, I suspect there'll be a bit of that. Now, I, having said all of that, my sense also is that there's a, a, a bit of unrest in the in the yes movement about lack of progress, as some people see it, uh, um, sort of dragging one's feet. Uh, why isn't something happening? Uh, what's, what's your sense of that? You speak to people right across the board. Yeah, I mean, I do, I do understand this. I, I tend to, let me start by putting this simply. I'm neither of the let's trust in Nicola approach, let's just keep stoom, and some kind of like, you know, basically the union dissolves itself by, by its own mistakes on its own, yeah. and we play this slow, cautious game. While at the same time, I'm clear, I don't like the, the I'm, I'm not trying to caricature the wild man approach to independence, that, that wouldn't be fair. But, you know, on, on the more um, fundamental or, um, you know, I don't know, uncompromising side of independence, wanting an independence referendum, i.e., like, you know, not quite next week, but as soon as possible, declaring UDI, a referendum that isn't legally watertight, etc., those sort of things. So I, I don't like that either. But what I do think we, we have to acknowledge is a bit, I mean, apart from the immense, I mean, the, the immense achievements of the SNP are, are so obvious. One just has to say to people who don't doubt that, I mean, people who are, say, vote for you know, Labour or Tories, is just imagine in Scotland without the SNP and the fact that all our political protests against Westminster and British politics would have to be, when the Tories are in, would have to be through the Labour Party. And yeah. then when the Labour Party are in power in Westminster, where would we go? You know, the Tories. Yeah. The Tories used to play a Scottish card, actually, if you go back to the 40s yeah. and 50s yeah. and so on. So, you know, it's not, it, it, it did happen in, you know, sort of living um, uh, memory. But I do think there's there's issues around 13 years in office of the SNP. I mean, I, I'm just reflective of whatever we think about the leadership there, because I think there has been a bit of a vacuum post 2014. The human yeah. cost and exhaustion to people, um, even before COVID, is just, is just immense. I mean, we were talking a bit about just, you know, what it takes to be a politician. We can snipe at politicians as much as we like and think, oh, we could do it better. But I I'm, but it's a tough, it's a tough, and particularly when you've got it's also a lonely thing in lots of ways, even when you try and do it maybe in a little bit more collegiate way than it's done done now. It involves immense pressures and then the, the expectation. It's like being a football manager, like you know, Neil Lennon, look at the pressure on him, but 10, 20 times more, because you've got the expectation of a whole independence community and constituency. Yeah. You know, willing you on, uh, and then you've got loads and loads of like amateur managers thinking they can do things better <laughs> if they don't get a shot at the dugout, you know. And so I think there's been lots and lots of positives, but yeah. I do think there's a sort of bit of a vacuum that has been there uh, since 2014. It is interesting when you think, just this last point, how the independence offer is remade. The only strategic move that's happened since 2014 has been the, the, the Growth Commission. And that has been, I mean, a bit sidelined by 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 Nicola Sturgeon. So there has to be more more of an independence offer comes out. It has to come out not just from the SNP leadership. And, and my last observation here is really that the SNP historically, even more than Labour when they were at their peak, the SNP haven't really known how to do cross-party cooperation because they're once the smaller party that Labour excluded, and now they're the dominant party and think that you know the, the, I mean, yes, Scotland wasn't a proper genuine cross-party group. It was basically owned by the SNP. Yeah. And then Greens came along and the SSP didn't quite like it for obvious reasons. So if the SNP are going to win well in, in a referendum, I've, I've actually made a Freudian slip there. If yes, it's going to win well in an independence referendum, it has to involve more than SNP voters. And that then means that it has to be owned by more than the SNP leadership. And that cannot be just some pretend front in a way. It has to be a more genuine offer. So that means... Yeah. 13, 14 years into office, they have to learn a bit to let go, which is, I think, again, trying to understand politicians as human beings is really tough. 
when you know you want to you want to make sure uh, mistakes don't happen. Yeah, yeah. I suppose that's the case. I mean, if, as you say, they're surrounded day and daily by a host of pressures and and uh, decision decisions that can't be put off, uh, yeah. then you can understand to some degree how uh, you would retreat in, into a sort of small circle of people that you really felt you could trust and depend upon and, and yes. tried to run things that way. I, I suspect all, all administrations have a temptation to go down that route. Yeah. But then, of course, you end up literally only listening to yourself because if you surround yourself with people who uh, constantly agree, then effectively you are talking to yourself. I mean, I, I'm a businessman. I've, I've worked at, uh, with boards and doing training and stuff. Uh, and it's a very common uh, situation for a chief executive, uh, uh, sometimes an uh, a executive chairman, even worse, to be surrounded by, frankly, people who, one or two gifted people, but a whole bunch of sycophants uh, who are looking to replace the, the chair or the chief executive uh, by offering uh, a route of least resistance, when the in fact the individual would benefit enormously from somebody saying, uh, I hear what you're saying, I have to tell you it's completely and utterly wrong. <laughs> but it yes. takes a lot of courage on both sides to, to make that possible. You have to create that environment. That's Otherwise, right. people will always count down, it seems to me. So... If you were sitting here, not talking to me, but talking to the Scottish cabinet, yeah. and you had three paragraphs, what would you actually tell them to do right now? Crikey. Um, they, they're, I would say to them, you know, there's been lots and lots of positives in the SNP being in, in office um, and 13 years in government, but they are, they are, I mean, I come at this from, I, when I was a member of the Labour Party, New Labour exhibited similar sort of tendencies, which is the, the limits of command and control politics. Command and control politics never, never continue working. They work for a very brief period, and then they begin to, practically from the, you know, day two, begin to go wrong because you cannot micromanage things. And yeah. so there's a, there's a law of attrition going on here in Scotland, which is very, very um, serious. And have, having understood it through the, the New Labour prism, uh, not from completely inside, but from knowing people close to Blair and Brown and so on, is it's never just based on arrogance. It's based on a mixture of, um, yes, a belief in your own you know, wisdom and enlightenment, but also a kind of sense of lack of confidence yeah. and, and a fragility about your dominance. So I get, I get that in the SNP um, uh, leadership because... You know, until 2007, they'd never won a national election. They were the outsiders of Scotland, the perpetual outsiders, and then suddenly they be they won, and then they become you know the the dominant um, force. So I think it would be to try and aid them into how to uh, let go a bit, which I, I think is 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 I, I totally get is a tough ask because the SNP cannot be the people that they, they we couldn't have got where we are without them we're not going to win independence without them but they cannot be they cannot own exclusively um in independence and so it'd be to, to talk to them about how to do that in a way i mean i i when um salmond was first minister i came up with a couple of policy ideas for them um including the there was a thing called the campbell christie commission on public uh, service reform oh yeah and um, so I, I, in one of my few meetings with Salmond, uh, suggested this to him and then wrote a pre C on it and so on. And, uh, and I had a number of rationales for why, why it should take place, which was about, you know, uh, bringing in the trade union movement, for example, into the conversation. Um, and, and people at like Campbell Christie chairing it, but others as well. Um, and it being a good strategic move for the government and the SNP. And they need, they need to think of things like that, but much, much more um, fundamentally. Yeah. One of the issues, I think, I mean, I mentioned class at the start. One of the other things I'm fundamentally interested in is power. And it is true that, uh, I mean, it's true of all the devolved governments in the UK. They are all centralisers. Uh, and we have seen Edinburgh's rise as a political centre. We have seen the rise of the Scottish government as an institution. And the sort of marginalisation of the Scottish Parliament, particularly when the SNP are a majority. And I'd like to see them flesh out more about the independence I'd like to see is one where the Parliament actually had less power practically and it was more held by the people of Scotland in different ways. And also within that, I mean, something lots of my friends mentioned to me, they worry about how we hold the wider power. I'm talking about cultural power, economic power yeah. in Scotland yeah. to account because we've often in our history 
not not done that very well. We had a media yeah. that until recently was you know talking generationally yeah. was very much part of a liberal unionist elite like the legal establishment, etc. Yeah. etc. They didn't talk truth to power. Now we have a diminished mainstream media that that wouldn't know that question if it hit it, you know, in the face, um, with with honorable exceptions. And so we have to have a think about that because independence is going would involve such big issues about power coming home. Well, that that's we're a good going point. to have to make sure that's a very yeah, good how we hold point. it. That's a, that's a very yeah, good point. Account. Yeah, I mean, a, a, a lot of what you've just raised could be answered by having a written constitution that constrains yeah. politicians in a way that it does in every other country, most other developed countries, not all but most, uh, with the exception of Israel and, and New Zealand, perhaps. But That's right. uh, and, and everyone else finds that to be essential. Uh, I've no idea why the feeling in the Scottish government is it's not essential. But uh, or doesn't appear to be the case. But I, I take your point. Let's let's assume that independence happened tomorrow. All of yeah. the ills that pertain to Boris Johnson administration would be inherited, lock, stock, and barrel, by the Scottish administration. The Scottish government would have unfettered power. There, because there's nothing to constrain it. Absolutely nothing. Well, well, it, so it, has, it, has, have, it has. It would have, it would have power to well, create. What? <laughs> well, I was going to say it won't have unfettered power because I mean that that's the point. And, and it has it has a kind of unfettered absolute abstract power, but but it operates in the world of interdependence. It operates in the world of you know labour markets, bond markets, and so on. So that that's that's the world into which this, an independent Scotland is born. So it's contingent on how how an independent Scotland is rated by you know the, the rating agencies. Um, and, and and so on, and I do think. But, but, well, but said, that that would also apply to the present UK. Uh, of course, but, of course, the course. But, but the reality is, because there's no written constitution in the UK, the government pretty much behaves. It makes it up as it goes along. It effectively writes the constitution daily because it has a, a working majority. All of that would be inherited by a Scottish government. There would be no right. overarching constraint on it at all. It may need to be sensitive to public opinion or international opinion. Well, yeah, there's all sorts of ways of handling that. Uh, but, you know, that, that it, it seems to me your point about the transference of power is enormously important. And I, I would agree with you. I don't think it's been properly addressed. Because the assumption yeah. in the independence community is it's a terribly good thing for power to move from Westminster to Edinburgh. Full stop. Mm. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and what you're saying is maybe that's not quite as straightforward as that. Yeah, but what what I'm thinking about is 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 is, is, is it's, it's kind of beyond civil society, but <clears throat> civil society and the public sphere are part of the issue here. It's about how in the wider interaction and exchange. I mean, an American writer I was reading about recently in terms of the, the Trump disaster we used this phrase. I mean, it's too fancy, perhaps. We talked about living in a society as a constitution of knowledge. By which yeah. meant there's this 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 rich exchange of ideas going on, and how how the, the ones that are supposedly the good ones come to the fore. Which which the point you're making was this doesn't always happen, uh, yeah. and why doesn't it happen? But we think of Scotland as a constitution of knowledge of the summation of us. It's how we make sure that your know, arbitrary use of power. I mean, when I was writing about uh, wider Scotland and independence referendum in, in my book Caledonian Dreaming, which I drew. The Irish writer Fintan O'Toole uh, wrote an introduction on uh, for, and I was drawing a bit from his thinking on Ireland and Ireland's experience in the crash. Scotland, yeah. up to the Indy Ref, if you think about it, had major institutional institutions collapsing. We had the Royal Bank of Scotland. We had the mm -hmm. Catholic Church in huge scandals. We had Glasgow Rangers Football Club. And, and what happened in all of those was, it's not just our media, but our kind of wider public life didn't actually hold these institutions to account. Yeah, um, and that's as a point. Some of my football friends make to me all the time. How do we, the, who are generally you know pro indie, but they say we worry about the, the the and they use terms like the monolith of the SNP or the power of the centre. How do we yeah. make sure we hold that to account when we are in this yeah. you know new world of independence? And they worry about it, and they'd like yeah. to. Well, you know, I I would I think they're right to worry, and I think that one of the major ways to fix that is to have a written constitution mm -hmm. that constrains politicians. Uh, I'm concerned that we might run out of time without talking about your your latest book, Jerry. Yeah. Tell us about it. Give us give us some background and detail. Well, Tell us why people we should rush out and buy a copy. That's Scotland after the virus. Um, it was really 
um, th- this 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 book came about because in in as we went into lockdown, I thought, well, obviously, eventually, there's going to be a, a world after the virus, and a Scotland after the virus. And so what I wanted to do was in, in, in creating this book and editing it with Simon uh, Barrow is to get into, I mean, there's obviously politics in this book. It wouldn't, wouldn't be uh, me otherwise, but yeah. it was to offer a sense of essays that were a hope and an invitation, even a provo- provocation to the world after the virus. And so in that, we devised the book very, very differently. There's, there's nine short stories about the world after the virus. There's six poems, and there's a whole host of other essays looking at the relationships the, how we build uh, kind of more supportive relationships of solidarity, looking at things like mental yeah. health and uh, bringing up children and so on. So, and then, and then there's stuff on more conventional politics. So in that, I mean, particularly dealing with the short story writers and, and the poems, the book was um, from beginning to end, a joy, a joy to put together and deal with some of these authors. Uh, well, also there's a really nice, uh, diverse mix of emerging voices as well, and BME Scotland and Younger Scotland involved in the book as well. So it's been, it's been a great experience, and uh, just out for the Christmas market, obviously. <laughs> there you are. Now, how do people get a copy of the book? And, well, you get it in. You get it in, obviously by online people. You get it from online people that pay their taxes. You get it from Lewis Press directly, who um, ship out copies uh, immediately, and in good bookshops that are open. Um, which uh, there are good bookshops in parts of the country still open as we speak. Right. I've got to ask you this question. Can people get it on Amazon? Uh, yes, they can. Oh, there you are. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you can. I mean, all books published by Lewis Press um, are, um, and indeed nearly all publishers, are uh, apart from very small, very small ethical uh, <laughs> who have, have respect for, uh, um, uh, sell, sell by Amazon Redwoods. Yeah. But so people people can get your book. I mean, it's a great pity that the bookstores aren't open because it would be nice to see. In some, places. in some places, yeah, go to your local bookstore, support your local provider, whoever that is, yeah. Uh, yeah. and maybe there's something in the book that probably underscores that point about local activities, local suppliers, yeah. local well, providers. Watch. Excellent, that's good. So there you are, folks. You really need to get, out and get a copy of Jerry's book. Just hold it up one more time so we know. But the title is, please. There we are. Scotland right. after uh, the after virus. virus. Okay. And, my, and that, that, that cover is a set of textures done by a, a Scottish weaver, James Donald, who has created a set of postcards in support oh, really? of the NHS um, with all the money of these postcards. Which, again, just typing in James Donald will bring up his website. And, um, you know, we, we love the fact of creating this book with that, this, this design with him. Um, Because the last couple, I've done a couple of books with Simon Barrett on um, SNP's 10 years in office, then the 20 years of devolution and not just devolution, uh, social policy. And we've done done some cracking, uh, um, as well as the content, we've done some cracking, deliberately, you know, striking front covers with artists that have been a a joy to do. Good. It looks great. It looks super. And and, uh, yeah, I think people underestimate this. They look at books and they look at the cover and they think it just happened, you know. You just say, no, it doesn't just happen, folks. Somebody spends a lot of time <laughs> and effort and energy on that. <laughs> yes, Let's go yes. back to the questions. Uh, Robert Light is asking, uh, do you think the Scottish mainstream media needs a complete root and branch reform after independence or, or do we bin it along with the BBC? Um, crikey. No, the, the, all, all through the Western world, Mainstream media is is in flux um, and in decline. The, 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 obviously, the bits of exceptions to this as parts of the liberal media uh, kind of had a blossoming under Trump and so on. Um, but we really need to think about um, new models of of, of media. Uh, BB, the BBC Scotland are our public service broadcaster in an independent Scotland. It would be, I think, desirable to have a public service broadcaster. That would not obviously be BBC Scotland. That would be an entity that, that came came from them. But there's ways of thinking about, in terms of the public sphere, how we, um, it, it links to the earlier conversation, how we support and nurture uh, as many pluralist voices and agencies as possible, whether that's through business models, whether that's through trust, whether that's through a bit of public uh, backing, et cetera. And I think that's one thing, it, again, relating this back to the earlier point, if we have a version of independence where power is kind of held by us, um, we should really be starting to think about that now. And, and really, in a way, it would be helpful as well in that if with 
the Scottish government and the SNP, we didn't have to sort of do it around them in a sense, which is what I think a lot of us feel, you know, um, at the moment. But if there was a way in which they went on that journey as well about remaking the, the, the public sphere and civil society of Scotland, because it, these are not these are not just luxury add-ons to a version of independence and politics. They're central to power being held and being diffuse and people feeling confident that, you know, in a way that like, some of the abuses and institutional disasters that I mentioned don't don't take place again. Yeah, yeah. Um, James Reith is asking, uh, should SNP politicians push the fact that Scotland uh, pays a whole lot more into the exchequer than it gets back? He says, it bewilders me why they don't do that. I think I think there's a lot of things about the the, the 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 transactional debate that I don't understand. I mean, for Scotland after the virus, I'll just give you one example. I was trying with some leading UK academics to define. I mentioned this here. So we have this notion of a fiscal transfer to Scotland. There is some fiscal transfer that takes place in terms of what one can identify. That's because the whole United Kingdom is so unbalanced that yeah. every part of the United Kingdom has a fiscal transfer apart from London. So, but I tried to get figures going down disaggregating public spending for what it cost Scotland 10 years of austerity per person, per head. We got we got two figures. We got to figures that we thought were it, but we couldn't, you know, we couldn't be 100% sure of them because I, I, and, and I haven't released them because I didn't want to put figures that could get shot down, but I don't yeah. understand why. There's just one example. That's, that's a really pithy example of, yes, if there's a fiscal transfer from UK state to Scotland, what has been the cost of us staying in the union per head of 10 years of austerity we never voted for. So the whole yeah. host of things, actually, I think a lot of people feel this, the SNP have had loads of successes and loads of positives, but in other aspects, there's an element which they're not that combative at politics, really, in a way. Um, and, and you have to say, I do worry about that a bit. You know, uh, a friend of mine said who went from no to yes after 2014, she even said to me in the last couple of weeks, she said, when there's an independence referendum, there will be a there will be a pro union three hundred and fifty million pound thing on a bus, and we need a figure on our bus. She said to counter that, and I thought, That's bang on, because you need you need some simplistic you know figures that cut through. That figure was a lie. We all know it was a lie. Dominic Cummings knows it's a lie, but it's traction to find the yeah. debate, and we need figures that clearly, hopefully, are not lies, but yeah. to um, counter counter their figures. I, I think maybe that's what the questioner. Uh, Robert Knight was maybe hinting at was the fact that uh, how do you ensure you get a proper debate if people can come on television or broadcast media and just lie? I mean, CNN decided that they weren't going to take it at the last election That's right. and, and said every time Trump lied, they said he's lying. Yes. Or, or, or they cut him off or whatever. But we don't do that here. People, no. I mean, uh, I watched Michael Gove being interviewed on Good Morning Britain. And Piers Morgan, he said categorically that Boris Johnson was the most popular uh, PM. And uh, then Morgan said, that's a lie. You just sat there and lied to us. And he said, look, he's more popular than you are. So he went on the attack and attacked the, the, the ratings for Good Morning Britain. Yeah. Uh, but it's, it just strikes me as very odd. That, 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 I mean, how can you have a proper political debate if people uh, indulge in this sort of behaviour, I think yeah. maybe that's maybe what Robert was hinting at too. I think that's a huge question, though. And I think, I mean, I, I have all my adult life, right, from a point, I can't remember when I had this epiphany, I've always tried to understand political opponents and I've always tried to understand Toryism because there is a, <laughs> loses, loses uh, viewers here suddenly, there, there was, I'm using mostly past it, there was an honourable story of large parts of British Toryism. Yeah. And what is interesting is that it's not an accident. We've had basically three dud Tory prime ministers in a row, Cameron, Theresa May, Boris Johnson. Um, Cameron thought he could do it effortlessly. Theresa May had a sense of public duty but didn't have the other skills. Boris Johnson's a yeah. born serial liar. So there's something going on in the Tory tribe, which is partly, I think, partly about ideas and ideology, but also the lack of membership. I mean, the talent, the lack of talent in that party. But when you have someone who's a serial liar becoming prime minister, that and 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 has been called out by people, and yet still yeah. getting away with it. It has yeah. it has a corrosive cost on everything, basically. I think. Yeah. yeah. Well, that, that's an interesting note for us to end on. We've just got a couple of seconds to go. I want to say a big thank you to you, Jerry. Uh, I think uh, I've learned a lot tonight, and I suspect other people have too. 
Uh, and a big thank you to everyone out there who's been watching and listening. Uh, we very much appreciate you giving up the time. Uh, and again, we have a formidable list of guests lined up for you. Uh, next week, with the nation talks to Ellen Hoffer. Now, Ellen is, uh, uh, is part of the EU Citizens for Independence. Uh, and of course, the, the uh, arrangements around EU citizenship are in a state of flux just now with Brexit almost upon us. So it'll be interesting to hear from her. Uh, Ellen is, uh, is German, so she can talk with some authority on this uh, from a personal level as well. Uh, oh, by the way, look out for the Constitution column uh, in the Sunday National <laughs> in the Seven Days Supplement uh, this weekend. Uh, it, it's my turn to write it, and I'll be talking about uh, the Tories' fantasy island. Uh, I, and like I say, you'll find it in the Seven Days section. Also, please support Indie Live. There's a whole bunch of stuff that goes on in addition to the TNT show that I'm sure you would find interesting. Go to the What's On guide. You'll find it on What's On. Uh, dot Scott, and you can see the whole cornucopia of offerings and services provided by Indie Live. Don't miss it. Uh, and thank you again for joining us. Joining us next Wednesday, and remember, it's been a great day for British democracy. And a big thank you, a big big thank you to Jerry. Good night, all. Never miss a live stream. The What's On Guide to live stream events and shows now has its own website. You can find the guide at whatsonguide.scot, independencelive.net, or on multiple Facebook pages. Do you create your own live stream events and shows? Get them registered on the guide. See whatsonguide.scot for full details. This is a new voice for a new Scotland. We know you're busy people, so most of our shows are also on demand on our Scottish Independence podcast channel, available wherever you get your podcasts. You'll see what a great variety of shows we have. There's something for everyone. Our newest on-demand platform is Indie Live Radio's YouTube channel. We have set up playlists for our most popular shows and current topics, currency, disc parties. New content is added almost daily, so subscribe and you won't miss anything. Join us. Thanks for listening. It's not acceptable to say we just keep on trying and we have another mandate and we can have another mandate and we keep on trying. You've got to make a political judgment that it's not going to work and say, well, in that case, we have either got to admit that we're not going to go for independence. And this is where I think the government has not been honest with people. That is, I'm not saying it will happen. I'm just saying that it is at least a possibility if we hone in totally on Section 30 we could not get a referendum at all.
um, under Section 30. And therefore, that to me means that you've got to find another way. But I don't think anybody who has gone over to yes now is really for moving because I think they can see clear as day what things look like. And I always felt that during the independence referendum that it would take a no vote in order for a lot of Scots to realise the consequences of voting no. They would have to see what happens when they vote no in order to realise what a mistake it was. And to me, that's the clear blue water between staying in the UK and going for independence. It's clear, regardless of what Boris Johnson said the other day, that they will want to go back to business as usual, where the ultra-rich are the ones who gain from everything. Mm. We don't want to be part of that. We want the chance to actually build a fairer country. It's the Brexit stuff for me, the nepotism stuff for me, breaking international law stuff for me, the ERG hijacking UK democracy stuff for me, education is a luxury stuff for me, £9,000 tuition a year stuff for me, it's the NHS on the table for US trade deal stuff for me, demonising the working classes stuff for me, refusing starving children free school meals stuff for me, it's Boris calling Muslim women letterboxes stuff for me, his picking any's comments stuff for me, his bum boys comments stuff for me, his Scotland is a verminous race comments stuff for me, the UK internal market bill ripping up the devolution settlement stuff for me, devolved legislators being a ignored during Brexit stuff for me, a lack of UK leadership during Covid stuff for me, nuclear weapons being in Scotland stuff for me, a decade of Tory government Scotland didn't elect stuff for me, it's a weak left opposition in England stuff for me attempting to frame independence as anti-English bigotry stuff for me, it's trying to ban anti-capitalist references in schools stuff for me, it's England-centric lefties painting SNP as a protest vote even though Scottish Labour is spineless stuff for me, it's the UK for me. Live. Yeah. A few people asked about YouTube. It'll be YouTube forward slash Independence Live. That's where you'll find the footage. Hi there, I'm, I'm Cliff. And I'm Russ. And I'm from, we're from the Veterans for Scottish Independence 2.0 group. And uh, we're just invading your privacy today to, to let you know that we will be uh, very shortly uh, pushing a programme out on live stream uh, to do with uh, uh, the veterans, uh, their needs, uh, as it will be uh, during an independent campaign. Uh, sorry, the next independence campaign, uh, and indeed in the independence Scotland. So get yourself in gear, come and join us, fill up a sandbag. Yes. Thank you. Cheers. Wherever you stand, get the fresh view of what's happening in Scotland with iScot. Celebrate everything about our country with intelligent, in-depth insight from lifestyle, culture to puzzles and all the opinions you'll need. Whether it's digital or by post, subscribe now to iScot.
never miss a live stream. The What's On Guide to live stream events and shows now has its own website. You can find the guide at whatsonguide.scot, independencelive.net or on multiple Facebook pages. Do you create your own live stream events and shows? Get them registered on the guide. See whatsonguide.scot for full details. It's the Brexit stuff for me, the nepotism stuff for me, breaking international law stuff for me, the ERG hijacking UK democracy stuff for me, education is a luxury stuff for me, £9,000 tuition a year stuff for me, it's the NHS on the table for a US trade deal stuff for me, demonising the working classes stuff for me, refusing starving children free school meals stuff for me, it's Boris calling Muslim women letterboxes stuff for me, his picking innies comments stuff for me, his bum boys comments stuff for me, his Scotland is a verminous race comments stuff for me, the UK internal market bill ripping up the devolution settlement stuff for me, devolved legislators being ignored during Brexit stuff for me, a lack of UK leadership during Covid stuff for me, nuclear weapons being in Scotland stuff for me, a decade of Tory government Scotland didn't elect stuff for me, it's a weak left opposition in England stuff for me attempting to frame independence as anti-English bigotry stuff for me, it's trying to ban anti-capitalist references in schools stuff for me, it's England centric lefties painting SNP as a protest vote even though Scottish Labour is spineless stuff for me, it's the UK for me. It's a song I wrote about five minutes ago called Carpe Diem, Hope Over Fear. How you threatened my words from an empire of money and gold. Well, you've seen in your country's potential for the lies you've been sold. Are you scared that the walls are too high to be breached by the bold? Will you stand and be counted or shut up and do what you're told? Hope over fear, don't be afraid. Tell Westminster Tories that Scotland's no longer your slave. Will you seize the day? Rip the chains from the unicorn, Scotland's no longer your slave. Let the TV man call you a nationalist for rejecting the lies. Ha! All the wobs of the few off the bob, cause he wears shots and ties. When they tell you that Scotland's no great, are you really surprised? Will you stand and be counted for something that money can't buy? Hope over fear, don't be afraid. Tell Westminster Tories that Scotland's no longer your slave. Will you seize the day? Rip the chains from the unicorn, Scotland's no longer your slave. on the climb Fighting wars for the wealth of the few How many have died You can bury 
my voice But the truth of it can't be denied Will you stand and be counted Cause I'll be there stood by your side Hope over fear Don't be afraid The Westminster Tories The Scotland's no longer your slave Carpe diem Will you seize the day Rip the chains from the unicorn Scotland's no longer your slave Will the media tell you that England don't want you to go? And the taxpayer-funded MPs tell you just tell them no. No! But in Manchester, Nottingham, Sheffield, they already know. And they're fighting for them, and it's only the start of the show. Ha <laughs> ha! Over fear, don't be afraid. Tell Westminster Tories that Scotland's no longer your slave. Copy the air, my friend, will you seize the day? With the chains from the unicorn, Scotland's no longer your slave. Yes, for a future. For more of a fear. Ha ha.